Please welcome to the stage your head like me for tonight, Ryan Trubas! <laughs> Hello. Hi, my name is Ray. I'm from this little place called London. Um, and it's great to be here. Thank you so much to Malfi and Deborah for having me. Um, thought I'd just do some poems. <laughs> um, is anyone here a teacher? Kind of. works in schools. Hello, teachers. Hello, hello, hello. Ish. Sometimes. You sometimes teach. Okay. So, uh, I was teaching for like three years in the school in Hackney, and what I found was trying to trying to make time to write became difficult to coincide with a teaching schedule. So I just took to writing haikus in lessons. There's three haikus that I wrote in the classroom. Um, number one: Lost spelling contest. Couldn't spell diarrhea. My shit's not solid. <laughs> Two. In English lesson, student flings dictionary, missile of language. Three. Student asks question, teacher does not know answer. Everybody learns. <laughs> and there was just one lesson because you get to use lessons um, where the students, in some ways, become. The teacher has said in that poem, and um, I never forgot this. I, there was a particular class I was teaching, and it was an all girls group. Um, so every time I was in uh, teaching this particular class, I was aware that I was the only male in the room. So I'll be taking the register, and there was just one particular student who would never answer her name. So I asked her at the end of one lesson, I said, "Why don't you ever answer your name when I take the register?" And she said, I'm not listening to you because you are a man, not my junkyard father. Mm -hmm. Sir, scrap my written off name from your brown filled mouth. You may be my teacher, but you are a man. Men felt my legs for burning their breakfast, and these marks lingered longer than my dad. I'm not listening to men because men turn on engines and run over my screen. Men have scrunched my mother, leaving my sister an airless airbag. Sir, when you crush a car in a junkyard, the windows don't crack. They burst, sir. I speak like a spiked fence, closing off green space for men to strip the best parts from, from unbreakable families, sir. I'm cutting clean from the clutter of your busted class because the last man to teach me did not know how to be unbreakable for his dismantled daughter. <laughs> I'm going to dedicate this poem um, to all of the Malfi poets uh, <laughs> because this is one of those poems that I couldn't write on my own. So it's great to be involved in a, in a community and to have experiences together uh, with a bunch of poets. Is anyone here from Ireland or been to Ireland? In particular, Dingle. Yeah. <laughs> all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she knows because she was there. <laughs> Um, this poem is called Looking for Dolphins, um, and it's just dedicated to all poetry and poetry communities. Dingle is a town in Ireland, County Kerry, on the bluest Atlantic coast. I am told that this bay houses the ocean's finest dolphin, a 40-year-old bottlenose named Funky, who may or may not appear below us as we climb Mount Brandon to catch the sun rising to the top of this Irish morning. Sorry, you know, top of the morning. <laughs> Along a path landmarked with small white crosses, as if faith has become something you climb, something which could be outlined by fences. While wind whistles into my hearing aids, and there is nothing I can turn off when breathing London lungs. We push our white breath into clouds as Adam touches everything he passes. Rocks, grass, white crosses, as if pressing memory into himself as if knowing that this is something that will leave a mark when asked where poetry has taken him. We won't remember standing ovations when six miles into sky, Simon tells us in eight months he will be a father, and we all hug like a bowl of light, even though Funky the Dolphin is yet to appear. 
something is moving in us all when we get to the top and stand by this black metal cross which meant nothing to us then as we watched the sunrise as if we watched the sunrise as if we had found a spot of earth but had never known darkness <laughs> So speaking of darkness and light, um, I thought it'd be fun to do, to do this poem which looks at darkness and light, just really literally from a kind of identity perspective. Um, this is a bit of a, a little bit of a, a social experiment because all I need to do is get the crowd here to say the word British and, and this is, it's an interesting way to, to gauge how, how tightly you can cling on to that identity of being British. Uh, so let's give it a go. So you're just going to say British. One, two, three. British. Cool. All right. Some people would deny that I'm Jamaican. British. Nose Anglo, hair straight. No way I'm Jamaican. British. They think I say I'm black when I say I'm Jamaican. British. But the English kid at school made me choose Jamaican. British. Half caste, half mule, house slave Jamaican. British. Light skin, privileged, straight male Jamaican. Eat the Kalaloo jerk chicken, I'm Jamaican. British don't know how to serve our dishes, they enslaved us. At school, I fought a boy in the lunch hall, Jamaican. At home, told dad that I hate them. All them Jamaicans, I'm British. He laughed, told me, you cannot love sugar and hate your sweetness. Went to me straight to Jamaica, Pass, passport. British. Cousins in Kingston called me Jar English. Proud to have someone in their family, British. plantation lineage, world war services. How do I serve Jamaican British. when knowing how to war is Jamaican? British. Thank you. So I thought um, the final poems I'm going to do, talking about the identity of ethnicity. Um, I've been writing and thinking about the identity of my deafness. Um, I guess the politically correct term is I'm hard of hearing. So I'd, as, as you watch these poems, I'd really like you to pay attention to Karen as well. Big up, Karen. <laughs> Every one of these poems in some way brings to light a new view of deafness. One. My ear amps whistle that they are singing to echo, God of noise, wailing for her return as an unraveled knot of songs, of blaring birds, of consonants, of doorbells, of sounds lost in my misty hearing aid tubes. Gaudi believed in holy sound and built a cathedral to contain it, pulling hearing men from their faded knees like atheism is a kind of deafness. Who would turn down God, even though I have not heard the golden decibel of angels? I have been living in a noiseless palace where the doorbell is pulsating light, and I am able to answer too. What? That word becomes another echo, a sound that keeps looking in mirrors like it is in love with its own vo volume. What? I am a one word question, a one man patience test. What language would we speak without ears? Is paradise a world where I hear everything? How will my brain know what to hold if it has too many arms? Would you deafen yourself if all you wanted to hear was already a memory? You can, you can applaud that by doing this. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, this poem is dedicated to anyone who has ever suffered tinnitus. Um, and if you can't remember what tinnitus is, it's like that high pitch, invisible noise in your ear. It's called tinnitus. Ten years after the diving accident, I'm having a hearing test in an audiology clinic. I'm meant to press the button every time I hear a high note. So I'm pressing the button and the audiologist tells me he hasn't started the test. I must be hearing the invisible fat lady. She is a constant bleep in the life support of my flatline hearing. 
I remember how hard she turned up as I walked out the blaring Zulu bar in Cape Town. Any speakers with enough bass to ripple waves in milk stout beer opened her stream. I took her home to meet mom, but she couldn't hear her tinny name. She called her my imaginary car alarm. But mom knew we were serious when I heard her for a week straight, teaching me love is a condition, an unpluggable siren, squealing advice. Ray, do not stay in that electric wave like an annoying friend ringing at night a constant wake-up call. In one tone, she tells me it doesn't matter how soundproof the room, she is still background music, a one-note opera. She has become my personal radio silence, tuning me out of a dark madness. Um, I found it really interesting that uh, the amount of self-help manuals that are online, in particular, the self-help manuals that are around sex. And I found that there weren't any, there was a, an interesting one which was about um, having sex with um, amputees. This one, I thought I'd write, and uh, it's uh, called The Art of Sexual Interaction with Deaf and Hard of Hearing Partners. Begins with the exercise of two fine qualities, originate and sympathize. Possess at the same time the habit of communicating and of listening attentively. The union is rare but irresistible. None but an excessively ill-bred person will ask if they can try on their partner's hearing aids. <laughs> Confine your remarks and attention entirely to the person with whom you are sexually interacting. Questions or statements such as, were you born deaf? Or, I think it's great that disabled people can get laid, <laughs> should be avoided. <laughs> Remember that your audibly challenged partner cannot read lips in the dark. <laughs> if turning off lights, dirty talk is impossible. <laughs> Unless speaking loud. <laughs> in a deep voice. <laughs> Whenever tying up your deaf or hard of hearing partner, safe words must, underline, must be accompanied with physical pre-agreed actions. <laughs> it is advised to avoid subtlety. <laughs> Eight out of 10 deaf and hard of hearing people say screaming is good. <laughs> Vibrations are also good for ensuring inclusive stimulation. Your intimate experience with a deaf and hard of hearing partner relies on the signs that sex is a language you both know how to sound out. So, this is my last poem. Thank you so much for having me again. Um, I'm on Twitter, it's been said. I, I, might, I might follow you back. At Raymond uh, I'm also running a uh, online YouTube series at the moment, at the moment called Rave Recommends, where I just talk about stuff that I like reading. Uh, if you want to subscribe to that. Um, so, again, thank you so much for listening. The first time I wore hearing aids, stepping out of St. Bob Holymew Hospital. I heard pigeon flapping, crowded city traffic, avalanche my ears like never before. And if there was silence behind any doors in my brain, they'd been unhinged. It is a miracle that anyone can think in this volume of busy. The first time I heard the bell on the bus, I kept pushing it <laughs> for every stop. And it vexed the bus driver. But I was a child, playing with sound. First day of school, Kieran saw my hearing aids and asked if I was a secret agent. <laughs> I said, yes. <laughs> my ears are investigators of missing sounds. And I can still hear Miss Williams taking register. Every present syllable of Raymond Antro bus was a silent prayer for absence. And when Dominic asked if support teachers sit with me in class because I'm stupid, I wish I said something smart to clarify my intelligence. <laughs> I wish my ears could pick up the answers. In speech therapy, I struggled with confidence. 
pronouncing it. Confida. The sound was too dense, too tuned out of frequency. In the hearing aid repair clinic, the TV is always on mute. <laughs> Or is it? <laughs> I had to turn my hearing aids off to write this because hearing aids make you hear everything except yourself. Thank you so much. <laughs>